are few, if any, traces left today of a number of buildings which once stood on the site of the present Millbay Park in Plymouth. These were alternately used as prison buildings to house prisoners of war or as barracks for the Royal Marines. The first reference to their use as Millbay War Prison was in 1779 during the American War of Independence when 959 persons were incarcerated there consisting of 578 French, 366 Americans and 15 Dutch captives. The buildings were again put to use during the Napoleonic era and again included both French and American prisoners following the outbreak of war with the newly formed United States of America in 1812. Due to overcrowding and a need to remove prisoners from the immediate coastline where it was feared attempts might be made to rescue them the prison at Princetown was constructed from 1806 on Dartmoor. The area around Millbay Prison at this time was less developed and a cemetery for deceased prisoners extended as far as what is now Athenaeum Street. A certain Samuel Fuge was contracted to remove corpses from the prison gates by donkey and cart and inter them in the area of ground in front of what is now the Crescent. As late as the 1920s and 1930s, it was still a common occurrence to disturb skeletal remains whenever digging was necessary to lay pipes or drains. By the time of the Crimean War that Britain joined in 1854, much had changed in Millbay Prison's surroundings. In 1824, a Dr Young had been granted permission by Plymouth Corporation and the Navy Board to commence construction of the Crescent and to fence off the area with iron railings and install shrubberies and walkways in exchange for laying down a road to the Hoe. This was Citadel Road, which ran along the course of an earlier lane called Mill Prison Lane. The layout of the area can be discerned from this map, surveyed in 1856, shortly after the end of the war. The present park can be seen on this modern street map. The experience of the Russian prisoners of war in Plymouth was not how we might imagine it. For one thing, they were a very diverse crowd, consisting of officers and lower ranks, men, women and children, Roman Catholics, Jews and Greek Orthodox, Poles, Finns, Cossacks and native Russians. Many had been taken prisoner, not in the Crimea, but in the Baltic, when a joint French and British force had stormed and taken the fortress of Bomersund on the Aland Islands at the mouth of the Gulf of Bothnia in August 1854. These prisoners were initially held on prison hulks at Sheerness, the place of Magwitch's confinement in Charles Dickens' novel Great Expectations, but were transferred to Millbay by the steamship Nile and Adelaide early in October 1854. By October the 14th, 1854, there were reported to be 716 prisoners at Mill Bay. The Portsmouth Times and Naval Gazette described their condition thus. The greater part of them are members of the Greek church. There were 51 Polish Jews, four Jewesses and one child. These are interesting looking people. They are industrious and may be seen at work in their wards, either at tailoring or shoemaking. The rabbi residing here has paid them several visits, and as money has been subscribed for them by their Jewish brethren, they have had meat and other things provided for them. There are about 200 Poles, nearly all of whom are Roman Catholics. One of these is a Polish gentleman who was degraded for the part he took in the Revolution of 1834. He was deprived of all his property and reduced. He has been their organist, and as far as he could, their minister. He stated to some Polish friends of ours, with whom he conversed, that they much wanted the visit of a priest, as they had had no religious consolation for two years, and the emperor only allowed them to be visited by a priest once a year. The organist is a very intelligent man, speaking his own language, German, Latin, and a little French. Since he was taken, he has been engaged in the Russian service, having been first imprisoned at Sveborg. A great many of them are from the Kingdom of Poland, but most of them are of the Lithuanian provinces, some from Mogilev and Vitebsk. They call themselves Poles, although their country's 
may have been possessed by the Russians for ages. There was a Cossack of the Don to whom our attention was directed. The Poles said that Nicholas compelled them to have their hair cropped behind, while the Cossacks had the privilege of wearing it long. They appeared to regard this as a great annoyance. The Cossack was a fine, well-built, handsome-featured man, a capital fellow for a soldier, and evidently had good stuff in him. The Poles seemed highly gratified at being amongst us, and the warder stated that the prisoners already began to speak of prolonging their settlement, if possible, beyond the war. One of them desired that he would write against his name, if Nicholas would send for him, dead. The Russians entertain different sentiments and appear to look upon their visit to England with sensations not at all so agreeable as those of the Poles. Nearly the whole of the men are whiskerless and most of them pockmarked, proving that vaccination is one of the barbarisms that Russian civilization has carefully eschewed. In May 1855, these prisoners were joined by around 250 Russian soldiers and 12 officers who had been taken captive in the Crimea itself and transported to Spithead, England, on board the Simla, and thence to Plymouth on the Falcon and Cruiser. A list of prisoners on board the Simla has survived, and one of these, prisoner 158, Stefan Osipov, a sergeant from the Sibirsky Regiment, and listed as wounded, was to die in the prison on the 6th of April 1856. He must have recovered from his wounds, however, because the cause of death was given as pathysis, an archaic term for tuberculosis. Because of the disparate nature of the prison population, the governor, Lieutenant Veach, was careful to make arrangements to keep the Polish and Jewish segment apart from the native Russian troops. He also arranged for prisoners to be aired on escorted excursions when they were taken along either the Exeter or Tavistock roads or even across to the countryside of Mount Edgecombe via the Cramwell Ferry. The Illustrated London News of March the 24th, even producing a sketch of one such excursion, showing the party of prisoners crossing the Octagon on what is now Union Street. Prisoners could also make use of workshops inside the prison to make boots and wooden toys and puzzles, which they were allowed to sell to supplement their allowance. Incidentally, this was a similar privilege to that allowed to Russian prisoners of war kept in Lewis Castle in Sussex, that was withdrawn after escapes and disturbances at the prison. Officers were paroled and allowed to roam the city freely. The treatment of the prisoners compared favourably to the conditions in which the enlisted Poles, Finns and Jews were kept during their service in the Russian army. Some deaths did occur among the prisoners and lacking the earlier facility used to inter the prisoners from the Napoleonic Wars close to the prison, the bodies were taken to what is now Ford Park Cemetery to be buried in unmarked graves. Most of the deaths were of a pulmonary nature, probably tuberculosis, as was the case with Stefan Osipov. This was a common killer in the 19th century, whose cause at the time was unknown and was particularly prevalent in crowded and insanitary conditions such as prisons, barracks, tenements and crowded, poorly ventilated workplaces such as coal mines. Most of these illnesses would have been contracted long before the prisoners were incarcerated in Mill Bay Prison, tuberculosis being a slow but deadly disease. One particularly sad demise was that of Gaida Trefanov, the wife of Andre Trefanov, a sergeant. Gaida died of uterine cancer on the 17th of May 1855 and was buried in Ford Park Cemetery in a ceremony that drew the attention of newspapers for its tragic circumstances. At least 21 prisoners, not including Gaida, are known to have been interred at Ford Park Cemetery. Because of illiteracy and the difficulty of transliterating names from the Cyrillic to the English alphabet, there are some discrepancies in the spelling of their names between the cemetery records, the England and Wales Register of Deaths and Devon Cemetery burial records. It is possible that Makur Egorov for instance, is the same person as Sergei Egorov, listed amongst Russian prisoners of the French at Constantinople, in which case he would have been one of those brought to England on the Simla and transferred to Mill Bay Prison. Regardless of the fact that the prisoners were interred in common graves, their comrades respected the grave sites and were allowed to perform ceremonies there 
appropriate to the various faiths represented. Here is a report from the Isle of Wight Observer of one such occasion in April 1855. On Tuesday, the Russian prisoners at Plymouth were permitted to proceed with their guards and keepers to the public cemetery to chant over the dead according to annual custom on the 17th of April. On Wednesday and Thursday, the Reverend F.D. Carson, chaplain to the Swedish Embassy in London, performed religious services in the Swedish language and administered the sacraments to the Finlanders. During the last three months, the deaths among the prisoners, about 600, have amounted to seven, caused chiefly by disorders of a pulmonary character. Not just deaths, but births as well, are recorded amongst the prisoner population. Here is the birth certificate of a boy named Alexander Prokofiev, born to Alexei Prokofiev, a private soldier, and his wife Domna, born Archipovna, on the 2nd of May 1855. As there is no record of the child's death in England, it is probably safe to assume that Alexander accompanied his parents back home to Russia after the war. Relations between the various groups in the prison were by no means harmonious. Many of the private soldiers had been conscripts, and the Poles and Finns in particular were antagonistic towards their Russian counterparts. At this time, both Poland and Finland were subject provinces of the Russian Empire. Poland had attempted a nationalist uprising in the 1830s that had been crushed. A British foreign legion was raised to take part in the fighting in the Crimea, and many of the Polish prisoners volunteered to join, causing at least one outbreak of violence in the prison before the groups could be separated. The Polish legion finally departed for the Crimea in May 1855. Other groups were returned home whilst the war continued in negotiated prisoner exchanges. One such is reported in September 1855, when several hundred officers and men were shipped on the Perseverance to the Baltic, and where they were to be exchanged for British and French captives. All in all, the Russian officers do not seem to have been much respected by their men. They were allowed much greater freedom and were paroled to spend as much time in the city centre as they wished. One particular cadet officer named Mikhala Datarnishkov drank too much in the South Devon Hotel in King Street and chose a fight with an invalided British soldier recently back from the fighting in the Crimea and with the local constable who tried to restrain him. After a weekend sobering in police cells, he was brought before a court held in the Guildhall on, mon on the Monday. This is a newspaper account of the proceedings. A Crimean soldier assaulted by a Russian officer. A case that excited much interest was heard at the Guildhall on Monday before the Mayor, Mr Thomas Stevens, and General Dunstable. A Russian military cadet named Mikhail Datashnikov dressed in civilian's attire, which had apparently suffered many a rub in the world, was charged with two assaults, one committed on a wounded Crimean soldier and the other on a constable of the borough named Henry Christmas. The prisoner is one of those Russians who are liberally pensioned by government and are, moreover, allowed to be at large on parole. Thus, with English money in his pocket and an English town to roam through, the life of a Russian prisoner is an enviable position rather than anything else. At least the particular cadet, now placed before the magistrates, had been making free use of his liberty, and in the course of his rambles on Saturday dropped into the South Devon Hotel King Street. He went into a parlour and had some beverage. When he came out he was intoxicated, and aimed a blow at the landlady in the presence of a soldier who had been frostbitten and shot in both legs in the Crimean campaign, and had been invalided home. The gallant fellow could not do much, but fancying probably that he had to deal with one of the Sevastopol Muscoves, called out, Bar, bar, that no bono. This irritated the Russian, who jumped towards the invalid and struck him. It was dastardly. Fortunately, just at that moment, Christmas the constable entered the hotel, and seeing the attempted assault, seized the Russian, drew him out of the hotel, and endeavoured to pacify him. But the cadet took no account of this kindness, but struck Christmas over the head with a stick, which broke with the violence of the blow. Christmas then gave the officer into custody of the police, and he was lodged in the station house until Monday morning, when he was both sober and sad. 
the evidence was all translated to the prisoner by a young Russian prisoner of extraordinary intelligence, whose cast of features was itself a recommendation to his character. He said in answer to the mayor that in his country, such offences as the prisoner had committed were considered very bad. There were also present Lieutenant Veach, Royal Navy, Governor of the Russian prisons at Milbay, and a colonel in the Russian army who was a prisoner on parole. Both these gentlemen, and the interpreter, appeared to be indignant at the conduct of the cadet, who stated he could not remember anything that had occurred. The mayor, in adjudicating, said the prisoner would remember that some time since, when one of the Russian officers had been preyed upon by a swindler and had been robbed, he came to that court and received redress. That court did justice then for a Russian, and now it was equally the duty of the court to do justice against the Russian by punishing him for his misconduct. The bench, therefore, would fine him 20 shillings and costs, and in default, 15 days' imprisonment. The mayor also requested the governor to call the attention of the Admiralty to the misuse the prisoner had made of the liberty that had been allowed him, leaving it to those authorities to decide whether the parole should be withdrawn from him or not for the offence. There were also less savoury prisoners who were conscripted convicts sent to Bombazond to help man the guns and then captured during the fighting there. As these prisoners were not simply prisoners of war, but felons as well, guilty of heinous crimes, according to a news article, they were transferred back from Milbay Prison to the Hulk Devonshire at Sheerness at the earliest opportunity. The Crimean War ended with the Peace Treaty of Paris, signed on March the 30th, 1856, and in April the Russian prisoners at Milbay were shipped home. Both Russians and Plymouth crowds cheered one another as the prisoners embarked onto the ship Imperatrix, moored in Plymouth Sound, and such was the bond that some Russians had formed that several tried to abscond and hide in the town and had to be found and returned to the ship. The Imperatrix called in at Plymouth to collect those prisoners kept at Lewis Castle in Sussex, and then sailed to Libau, modern-day Lipaja, on the Baltic coast of Latvia, where they were exchanged for British and French prisoners of the Russians. This extract from the Essex Herald is useful for a summary of the number of prisoners incarcerated in Milbay Prison and for the number of deaths, 24, occurring there during the stay. Release and departure of Russian prisoners. The hired steam transport in Peratrix, Commander H.T. Cox, with 25 Russians from Sheerness, arrived in Plymouth Sound on Monday and sailed therefrom on Wednesday with 20 Russian officers and 697 soldiers and seamen, calling at Portsmouth, where she will embark about 350, and then sail for Libau, when she will bring back any English prisoners who may be there. The Russian priest, who has been in the habit of visiting Milbay Prison, and who distributed among his countrymen money sent from their government, took passage in the Imperatrix to Portsmouth. The first detachment of Russians, 740 from Bombazond, were placed in charge of Lieutenant Veach, Royal Navy, at Milbay, Plymouth, on the 7th of October, 1854, and from that date to the present, 1,370 in all have been lodged there. During the entire period, they have been in medical charge of Mr Robert Stevenson, Royal Navy, whose uniform attention was greatly appreciated. The deaths of 24 show an average only of about 2.5%. During their sojourn, not the least insubordination has occurred, and the extra services of neither the civil nor military authorities have on any occasion been required. When the government steamers, Pike and Confiance, were casting off from the pontoon at Milbay to convey the Russians to the Imperatrix, the separation from the governors, his officers and warders could be likened only to the parting of friends, and cheer and counter-cheers were exchanged between the steamers and the numerous spectators on the waterside. Among those embarked at Plymouth are 77 seamen from the Diana, and 40 from Kerch, and 57 Greeks from the Crimea. The establishment at Milbay is ordered to be closed, and Lieutenant Veach has received instructions to pass con the control over to the Marine Department. In 1911, as part of the coronation ceremonies for King George V, Milbay barracks were finally demolished and replaced with the present park. 
A long piece in the Western Morning News described the arrangements for the ceremony, together with a brief history of the use of the barracks as a prison during the Napoleonic War. Remarkably, the newspaper failed to mention any of the story of the Crimean War prisoners, surely a more interesting topic. One possible reason for this is that the remains of the few Russian prisoners who died rest in Fort Park Cemetery, whereas the bodies of the larger number of French and American prisoners who died during the Napoleonic era were buried in the neighbourhood of the prison, and no doubt the bones of many still lie undisturbed beneath the surrounding streets. Several British names are connected with this story of the Crimean War prisoners at Mill Bay. One is William H. Perrett, whose name appears as the informant on the death certificate of Stefan Osipov and Gaida Trefanov. In the 1851 census, William is listed as a master tailor born in Revelstoke in 1825 and living with his wife Frances and two children in the village of Yelmton. There is no obvious reason why William should be associated with these prisoners until one looks at the 1861 census, and here he can be found resident in Westminster, London, and described as an officer at Millbank Convict Prison. Millbank was a particularly bleak and notorious prison that once occupied the site now containing the Tate Gallery on the banks of the Thames. William must have begun a career as a prison guard when the barracks at Millbay were converted into a prison to hold the prisoners of war and transferred to London once the prison reverted to its original use. He died in Wandsworth, London in 1910, having raised a considerable family. Lieutenant Harry T. Veach, Royal Navy, Governor of the prison, had proven to be an efficient, humane and popular figure with staff and prisoners alike, and his orderly management was probably responsible for the low death levels among the prisoners. On closure of the prison, the staff presented him with a silver snuff box as a mark of esteem. He was appointed an emigration agent in Liverpool as soon as the prison closed. He had married a Georgina Amani Lawrence in East Stonehouse in 1843, and tragically he left her behind in Plymouth, as she had died in 1855, and is buried in Ford Park Cemetery in a family vault close to Ford Park Road. He next became the master of a frigate named the Akbar that was converted to use as a reformatory ship for juvenile delinquent boys, presumably with the intention of then recruiting the boys into the Royal Navy as sailors. In 1857, Harry moved on from Liverpool to Portsmouth, where he was appointed superintendent of Haslar Hospital, and in 1859 he remarried to a Jane Maria Fayon. He passed away in Greenwich, London, in 1890 age 76 years.